So I would like to now welcome Mr. Duncan Jones. Uh, he'll be talking about nine common things that stunt businesses' growth. And uh, Duncan, here we go. <laughs> yeah, cheers. Uh, I'm Duncan. Uh, you can hear from my twang already probably that I'm from New Zealand. Uh, I've been in digital marketing since 15, 16 years old, uh, back when AdWords first launched and it was 10 cents a click back in the glory days. Uh, I'm head of strategy and growth at Web Profits, a digital growth consultancy. The one good thing about working at a digital growth, there's lots of good things, but one of the good things about working for a digital growth consultancy is you see businesses across all industries, across, across all stages of business growth, uh, and good businesses and bad businesses, uh, ones that struggle. So today I'm just going to give you some insight into nine common things we see uh, that are holding them back from growth. I thought I'd ask my LinkedIn uh, audience what is holding back businesses from growth. I figured the first nine answers I'd get would be the things I'm running through today. Turns out there's a lot of things holding businesses back from growth. Uh, so the nine that I'm going to give you, uh, they've definitely got a marketing slant. Uh, I'm a marketer, uh, but I hope you take away just one of them uh, and improve in your own business because uh, it will definitely impact your growth in a good way. Number one is silos. Silos. Everyone knows they hold back growth. Uh, you can have silos between departments. Uh, you've got your marketing and your sales departments. They always seem to be at wars across all different companies. Um, but they hold back growth because of lost opportunity. Uh, if you've got your marketing team driving heaps of leads to the sales team, and the sales team aren't feeding back information about the lead, about which ones are good, which ones are bad, you've lost a lot of opportunity to keep improving your marketing there. Uh, silos can also be between departments, within departments though. Uh, so you've got your content team, your email team, your social team. If you're creating an awesome piece of content for SEO purposes and you're not sharing that with your email database and not promoting that on Facebook and not capturing emails, uh, you're missing a lot of a lost opportunity. They can also be between external partners, so agencies, consultancies, anyone you use externally. Uh, everyone passes the buck. Uh, there's a lot of double handling, a lot of explaining things multiple times, uh, and it's not very often that agencies talk to each other. Uh, so that's again lost opportunity uh, that's impacting growth. So what should companies do? Uh, the main way that we seem to, that especially if you're a bigger company, that you can solve this is by creating dedicated growth teams. Uh, what I mean by that, I mean a team within your company. It might not be their primary role, uh, but a team which is made up of people from within your organization. Someone from sales, someone from marketing, someone from customer support. Across all your organization, as many people as you can with differing opinions. Uh, their one goal is to grow your company through any means possible. Uh, it's really good to bring people from all different departments because it starts to break down those silos. Uh, if you've got someone from sales who's influential in the sales department in this team, they can get things done within their own department. Uh, so that can be a really good way. It's something even Facebook did. They got to 100 million users and their growth plateaued. They stopped growing. Uh, I mean, they're still growing, but stopped growing as rapidly. Uh, so they actually created their own dedicated growth team. And that's in a startup that you think would have that culture back then. Uh, but it worked pretty well. As far as external partners, that's tough. Uh, if you can slim your agencies, consultancies down to one and get them handling everything, that's going to be a lot better. Uh, but within that agency, there might be silos as well. Uh, so same problem. Uh, a few things that we've seen that work, um, working with other consultancies and agencies, uh, aligning and linking their goals. If you've got them all working at different goals, then that's not going to help the growth uh, very much. Having clear responsibilities and setting your tracking and attribution. So there's just no arguing over who got the conversion uh, because that just wastes time. Uh, and loses opportunity again. Uh, having combined meetings. So if you can have a meeting with all your agencies once a month, once a quarter, and they put forward representatives, they can actually find out what everyone else is doing. And most agencies are professionals, you're paying them, they want to keep you as a customer. Uh, so that should help, they should be looking to maximize what the other agencies are doing. Uh, we even do things like open communication, Slack channels with our clients and all their other agencies. So everyone can see what we're up to. Uh, it's transparency. Uh, most agencies and consultancies don't like that, uh, but it will help your growth for sure. Number two, everyone working at different goals and metrics. Now, it seems awesome in theory. You've got your SEO team trying to influence SEO rankings. You've got your sales team just trying to close the first sale, our retention team focusing on that. Uh, the problem with it is if you don't get those metrics that all the different teams and individuals are working towards, all the different KPIs, they're going to be making decisions which might impact your growth negatively. Uh, they'll be looking at how do they spend their budget, who do they employ, what do they prioritise first. Uh, and if they are prioritising based on those metrics, which don't actually represent your business growth, it is going to impact your business growth. So what should you do? This is a hard one. Uh, you have to try and simplify all of your metrics down to a single metric 
which is trackable and which if you grow month on month will also grow your business. Uh, if you're a super company, for example, you may drill it down to just super signups, people switching their super. Of course, you're gonna use all the other metrics that you've got to optimize campaigns, to optimize your AdWords, your Facebook, to optimize your business. But if you get everybody within the company singing the same tune, uh, it can really impact your growth in a positive way. So what should you do once you work out that metric? Uh, you should regularly share it. Uh, you should have a dashboard. You should email it out to your company. You should share it monthly. You should regularly share it so everybody in the company knows how it's going, how is business growth going. Uh, that way, you'll find that people within the company start optimizing their time, their budget, how they prioritize with that metric in mind rather than all the different other metrics that they're trying to grow. They'll still use those metrics, but if they start thinking with that mindset that I want to grow this metric month to month and you celebrate the wins, uh, it will definitely have a positive impact. You don't have to get that metric right straight away as well. Uh, you might find you've been using a single metric for two months and it's grown month to month, week on week, but your business isn't grown. You've potentially got your metric wrong. Uh, the super example, uh, that's a real example. We found a lot of companies were switching super, great. We're growing that metric month to month, but they weren't funding their accounts. They weren't actually telling their employer that their super had changed. Uh, so we switched that to be funded super accounts. And then later on, funded super accounts with a $100,000 balance. So you can keep evolving that metric that you're tracking towards. And if your business pivots and you launch a new product, it might be growing that metric. Uh, but it's just important to have one metric that your whole company are talking about and trying to grow. Another thing, not knowing the numbers. Uh, you'd be surprised at how many clients we ask, what is your lifetime value? What's your lead to sales close rate? What's your profit margin on a sale? Uh, most of them, not most of them, a lot of them don't know it. Uh, they don't know the numbers and it impacts growth because you make the wrong decisions. Here's an example of a wrong decision you could make uh, with your digital marketing, for example. The company A, uh, they think that their lifetime is value is $600. They don't really know though. They haven't worked out all the metrics. Uh, they've got a couple of channels they're working. Channel one, $400 acquisition cost. Channel two, 300. Channel three, $800 acquisition cost. Let's cut it. It's not profitable. Uh, the competitor on the other hand who's actually done all the maths and worked out exactly what their lifetime value is, they know it's profitable. So not only will they keep that cha third channel on, they'll actually ramp up uh, and be more aggressive with their bidding. And if you're competing against that type of customer, you're in trouble. Uh, they can spend more on AdWords, they can spend more on Facebook than you to get that client. Uh, so that definitely impacts growth, not knowing your numbers. What should you do? You have to do the work. Uh, you have to ensure that firstly, the data that you're pulling out of all the different platforms is correct. Uh, the tracking that you're using, the attribution model you're using is correct. Otherwise that can lead you to a wrong decision even though you did the calculations. And then you have to actually just do the maths and work it out. Uh, that's the lifetime value formula. For some reason there's about 30, 40 different formulas on ways to work it out and they're all complex. Uh, but if you, if you work it out with the data you've got, you can just keep improving it. So it doesn't have to be perfect first time again. It's just good to have that in the back of your mind because then when you make a decision, you'll have a better inkling if it's a good decision or a bad one uh, and won't turn off things that are actually growing your business. Number four, one-off marketing. Uh, so one-off marketing, marketing departments, especially within huge companies, love it. Uh, especially ones that have come from a brand-focused or offline-focused uh, mix and then changed over to digital marketing. Uh, the reason they love it, it's exciting. Uh, it's awesome to run one-off events. It's awesome to launch content about a timely thing. Uh, but the problem with that is all that time and effort that you put in has a limited time to make your return on that investment. Uh, so you do all your design, your development, your copywriting, your planning, you launch your campaign, uh, say the 2017 business trends, great, you launch your piece of content, you get your return, then it stops. It's not really relevant in 2018. Uh, and same with competitions, events, like if they've got an end date, that's when your return ends. Uh, so you have to try and build as much as you can, profit as you can out of that. Here, here's how it looks visually. Um, seven technology trends went really well. Uh, start of 2017, huge spike. And then it just petered down. No one really cares by about March, April, about uh, trends for the year. Uh, on the other hand, a piece of evergreen, always on uh, content, that's still delivering results today. That was the same amount of time, same amount of effort, same budget, same investment, but it's still delivering results. Uh, so by focusing less, you don't have to focus 100% of your time on evergreen stuff. It's still important that e-commerce stores run sales. It's still important that you run branded campaigns and build your brand in that way. But if you spend more of your time on building assets, what you'll find is that over time, your ROI will just keep growing. Uh, you'll have all these pieces of content, all these, could be a remarketing funnel that just has evergreen offers that can always work. Uh, could just be promoting your USP, uh, which is, you know, might be free shipping, right? But if you're an e-commerce store, 
you could just create campaigns around promoting that because you know it's not going to change. That way you put all that time and effort and money in, uh, but you'll keep delivering results. And here's an extreme made up example of uh, what could happen if, if you just have spikes of one-off campaigns versus building assets over time uh, that can definitely impact your growth. Number five, the key word of probably every single conference for the last five years, automation. Uh, but it is a big deal and people still aren't doing it. Uh, people still aren't using automation enough. Uh, we've got com companies that copy and paste uh, from one platform to another that export data and import it, uh, that get us to do that work. Uh, they're paying an agency to do manual labor, uh, manual work, and that's definitely impacting their growth. Uh, why? Time. Uh, your time should be spent on working out that lifetime value formula, on creative, on strategy. Uh, I think a lot of the problem with automation is it's seen as a huge thing, something you should change your whole company with one big change. Uh, what we've found works quite well, especially at Web Profits, is actually just empowering your team to giving them budget, giving them resources, incentive, to automate anything that they're doing that's manual. So don't look at it as a huge software project that you have to do across the whole company. Just give them, say it might be $500, $1,000 budget to automate anything that they're doing manually. We've done this across Web Profits, and we've had people building their own software, their own scripts, their they're automating heaps of their job. People hate doing that manual labor week on week, reports and things like that. Um, so they might find pre-built software uh, that works for them. They might build their own software if you give them resources. Uh, they may even outsource processes uh, overseas. If you can't automate something but it's manual and repetitive, uh, you can probably outsource that for a lot cheaper. Um, and that frees up a lot of time to focus on things that will actually grow your business. Another thing markets like, uh, which was touched on earlier, is the top of the funnel. Uh, people love awareness campaigns, Facebook ads, content. Uh, people love consideration, email marketing, uh, and people love straight conversion activities the most, running search ads on Google. Uh, the problem with that, it works, uh, but the problem with that is you're ignoring a huge part of the funnel, uh, and most companies spend 100% of their time on this part of it. The part you're missing is the customer itself. Um, the custom Marketing to the customer itself, you don't have the AdWords click costs, you don't pay $30 a click, you've already got them, uh, they're already brand loyal, most, most likely, uh, and you can still build a lot of value from those people uh, that will help your growth. So things like retention, making sure that they stay on as a client, uh, upsells, bringing up that average order value, um, things like using them in testimonials and reviews to help you get extra customers for every customer you bring in, and referral programs, uh, setting up referral programs. That will help your revenue, your profit, and your lifetime value, uh, because you're not having to reinvest and keep finding those new customers, uh, and it doesn't actually take that much time. Uh, you can automate a lot of those processes uh, down the funnel. By focusing on the bottom of the funnel as well as the top, what you find is that every single new customer you bring in is worth that much more to you. So that means you can actually reinvest more into the top of the funnel. So focusing on the bottom things is very important uh, and it's a mistake that companies make. Number seven of things that we see commonly that uh, stunt growth is setting ad budgets in stone. This is just an example I found, uh, but it's, we've had this from clients before. Here's how much you should spend on banner ads in February next year on this channel. How do you know? Uh, that assumes that you've got the best forecasting ever. You can forecast what channel is going to work the best, how much you can spend on that channel, which month is going to go up and down. I think it's impossible, uh, but I'm not a forecaster. Uh, what's better than that and what will help your growth? So the worst is clearly, in my opinion, allocating it down by channel. Um, better than that is if you get a total budget from your board, you can't go above that. That's fine. Uh, you just have to fluidly optimize those budgets month on month, if not week on week, uh, if your budgets are big enough, uh, based on performance. And not only based on performance, based on how much you can spend on each channel um, profitably. Better than that is unlimited budgets. Uh, unlimited budgets is pretty scary uh, for a lot of people. Uh, and I don't mean unlimited budgets without a star. The star is that it has to be profitably spent. So if you know from your tracking, your attribution, your lifetime value, that you can spend $150 to get a quality lead and you're still making a profit, why would you want to turn that tap off? Uh, why would you want your AdWords running out halfway through the month because you've hit your budget? Uh, if you work with an unlimited budget concept in mind, what that frees your team to do is to find a channel, make it profitable and scale it up as much as possible. Get as much volume out of that channel, as much sales, as much leads as they can, and then move on to the next channel and repeat and repeat. Over time, your marketing budget will skyrocket. Uh, we've had clients that their marketing budget just goes up month on month. Um, but as long as you've got your tracking, your attribution right, and your numbers right, then your profit will grow as well. 
Uh, there's definitely cash flow implications and things like that, which you can't ignore, uh, but it's just a, a shift of, in concept with how you set budgets uh, that will impact your growth positively. Number eight, you can see I care about this one. I'm trying to get through nine things in 20 minutes, uh, but speed, speed really matters. Um, and the reason it matters is because the slower your organization goes, the slower you get to those winning ideas that will really move your business growth. Uh, it might be a new channel, it might be a business improvement, it might be a new product. Uh, if you have two companies that are exactly the same in all aspects, and one of them is working way faster, they'll grow faster. They're probably gonna fail just as many times, but they'll get to those winning ideas a lot faster. Uh, speed is pretty hard to change in a company. Uh, it seems to be ingrained in companies' cultures a bit. Uh, I'm certainly no change expert, uh, but here's what we do uh, at Web Profits and with some clients. Uh, we look at hiring better. So we hire people from with that aren't in our industry, uh, people that think differently, because uh, that can start to change the concept, the culture from the ground up. Uh, we look to hire entrepreneurs. Uh, we've got an ad up that just tells entrepreneurs we want to hire them. Uh, it doesn't even say what they're applying for. Uh, but they look at things in a different way. They think for faster, better ways of doing things. Uh, and that type of mentality across your company can be really good for speed. Uh, we also test candidates with things they've never done before. So people come in, have you ever logged into AdWords? Great, here's an AdWords test, we need it by tomorrow. That shows you how quickly they can learn. And digital marketing's changing. We've already seen about AI and machine learning. Digital marketing's changing so quick. Uh, so you need people that can think quick, research quick, uh, and get things done uh, so that you can keep up with competitors that are doing that. Uh, manage better. You've got to stop micromanaging. And if you've got any managers that are doing that and having meetings about things that, decisions that you probably don't need meetings on, that's definitely going to slow you down. Uh, and that's why as, the, as you move from startup to bigger companies, your speed gets affected, uh, the speed that you can do things. Uh, so just instead allow the team to make decisions on their own. Uh, and the manager instead should just be working on removing roadblocks and creating processes and documenting things and getting through compliance and getting the development team uh, to hurry up and things like that uh, and stepping out of the way and letting their team get on with things and test things and track them. If you do have slow teams, you've got to show them wins. You've got to get their buy-in somehow. It's pretty hard. Um, but if you get their buy-in, show them that the progress that they're making, the speed that they're going is impacting uh, in a positive way will hopefully help. Uh, and if their KPIs are aligned, like I talked before, uh, having everyone's KPIs aligned, hopefully that will help as well. The ninth one and last one is not prioritizing correctly. Uh, everyone's got a to-do list and you know how easy it is and how satisfying it is just to tick off all the easy ones. Checking your emails, replying to emails, updating some copy, things like that. Of course it's easy to do that uh, and people seem to like that and that's fine. Unless you're looking at it at company level. Uh, if you're looking at it at company level and everyone's focusing on those easy things, they're probably not the things that are really going to grow your business. It's not a big business improvement. It's not a huge new product launch. Generally, that they're ticking off first in the week um, and that can really impact things. So what we do, uh, we use a prioritization method uh, called ICE. Uh, there's one called PI. I don't know why all these names, but there's a lot of different ways you can prioritize. Uh, we chose this one. Uh, just works across our company and our clients. Uh, and essentially, you grab all the ideas that could grow your department, grow your business, anything you need to work on, and rate them out of 10 or five uh, for three things. Impact, what impact will it have on growing your one metric, that metric I talked about before? How likely is, is it to grow that metric? Confidence, how confident you are based on past experience, based on what you can see competitors doing, that it will work. And ease of implementation is the biggest. If it's gonna take developers three months to do it, should it be the first thing you focus on? Or should you focus on something that you can get done within a couple of days that is likely to have the same impact? Uh, by doing that, you'll basically, you'll give your teams the prioritization method they need to roll out things the fastest, and that will impact your growth uh, pretty positively. To recap, there's lots of different things, uh, lots of different ways you can, um, that are stunting your growth, uh, lots of things you can improve in your business. At Web Province, we, we believe there's always a, there's our why. Uh, there's always a smarter, better, faster way of doing things. I don't know if faster made it in there, but it should have. Um, and that just means you can just never settle. Uh, now we've got 82 things on the LinkedIn post to work through. Uh, those are nine that we see commonly holding businesses back. Uh, we, we've launched our own uh, growth marketing service that aims to help with companies with a lot of those issues. Um, and we're always trying to improve that as well. Uh, it never ends. But yeah, if you want to chat about that, uh, come see me afterwards. <laughs>